Shalom, the grace and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. This is the homily for the fourth Sunday of Lent, year A. The theme that I have chosen for the Sunday is the healing based on the gospel reading. Jesus heals a blind man in the festival of Sukkoth in the temple. Brian Stoffridge wrote the following and it is worth reading here. It has been suggested that the origins of denominations occurred when the healed blind men met each other. At first they were all excited about the miracle of sight that Jesus had given them, but as they talked about how Jesus had healed them, they began to discover some significant differences. For some, the healing came with simply a touch from Jesus. Matthew 9 verse 29. Another proudly boasted that he had enough faith so that Jesus didn't have to touch him to perform the miracle. Mark chapter 10 verse 52. Another meekly exclaimed that Jesus not only touched him twice, but also spit on his eyes in order for him to see clearly. Mark chapter 8 verse 23. The final one really felt embarrassed to admit that even though a touch wasn't part of his healing, Jesus' spit wasn't enough. Jesus had mixed his saliva with dirt and put the mud on his eyes and then told him to go and wash in some pool of water. John chapter 9 verse 6 to 7. Today's gospel reading. Since each one thought his healing was normal and better than the others, they divided into spitites and non-spitites, mudites, non-mudites, touchites and non-touchites. Denominationalism was born. John, a first century Jewish man who believed in Jesus, recorded this Sukkot miracle. Jesus' healing of the blind man shocked the people of the day, not only because the act itself was amazing, but also because the timing was specially significant. It is no coincidence that Jesus performed this miracle immediately after Sukkot for he used both the healing and the holiday to make some almost unbelievable claims about himself. Now, I would like to place a video. It's a fantastic video which will give you a background to the miracle. During the second temple period, additional celebrations were added to Sukkot. Each morning during the seven days of the Feast of Tabernacles, a procession of priests came down from the temple to the Pool of Siloam, whose water came from the Gihon Spring and was the principal supply of water for Jerusalem. With a golden pitcher, a priest drew water from the large pool. Because it came from a spring, the water was considered living water and used for ritual purification. The priest then took the pitcher of living water and returned to the temple. As they arrived at the court of the priests, they circled the altar once and then the priest poured the water out onto the altar of sacrifice. They did this for each morning for the six days. On the seventh day, called the great day of the feast, the same ritual took place except the priest circled the altar seven times instead of only once. This ritual symbolized Israel's request that the Lord bless them with rain for the next harvest season. On this very day, when Israel was praying for rain, Jesus proclaimed, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. By Jesus proclaiming that he was the ultimate source for living water, he was giving a clear and direct declaration of his divinity. The day following the feast, Jesus found a blind man and spit on the ground, making a small amount of mud. He anointed the blind man's eyes and told him to wash in the pool of Siloam, the exact same pool where the priests had drawn living water for seven days. The blind man obeys and is healed. Eventually, he is able to see the one who gave him sight. The Feast of Booths, also known as Tabernacles, in Hebrew, uh, Sukkot, had ended. The crowds had dispersed and those who had traveled to Jerusalem from the outlying regions were making their way home. 
Jerusalem was returning to its usual bustling pace. People were still talking about the spectacular light that had shone from the temple and cast a glow upon the whole city. However, it was difficult for the man who sat by the entrance to the temple courtyard to understand these conversations. He had never beheld a giant candelabra shining into the night, and although he had felt its warmth and heard it crackle, he had never even seen fire, for this man had been born blind. I was blind when the festival began, and now it's over, and I am blind still, he thought. And so it shall probably be until the end of my days I shall sit here begging for a few measly coins always. He nodded in the direction of the sound of someone walking into the temple. Later that day, he heard a group of people approaching. The group paused before him. And the blind man heard one of them ask, Rabbi, who sent this man or his parents that he should be born blind? The concept of sin is quickly introduced via the disciples' question in verse 2. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Words for sin occurs in the Gospel of uh, John repeatedly. Uh, the Greek word is amartano, that is to sin, and amartia, that is sin, and amartolos, that means sinner. These three words repeatedly occur in the Gospel of John. It also reflects traditional Jewish speculation on the relationship of illness and sin. The first century Palestine uh, people commonly assumed that disease and disorders on both the personal and national level were due to sin. As summarized in the rabbinic saying from around 300 uh, BC, that there is no death without sin and there is no suffering without iniquity. Consider the biblical text underlying first century thought. Based on Exodus chapter 20 verse 5 and Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 9, where God promises to punish children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generations, example, a birth defect must have been the result of parents or grandparents' sin. B. Based on Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 20, a child shall not suffer for the iniquity of a parent, nor a parent suffer for the iniquity of a child. The righteousness of the righteous shall be his own, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be his own. A birth defect must have been the result of sins committed in the womb by the child. The rabbis debated whether fetuses could sin, some arguing they could, for example, Genesis Rabbah chapter 63 verse 6, and others that they could not, Genesis Rabbah chapter 34 verse 10, a line of reasoning because of the enmity between Jacob and Esau in the womb. These seem to have been two views present in Jesus' day. But Jesus' words in verse 3 to 5 turn the conversation away from the disciples' conventional theodicy, that means justice of God concerns. In the fourth gospel, sin is not a moral category about behavior, but is a theological category about one's response to the revelation of God in Jesus which for John in the heart of the semia, which means sign. The man's blindness is not an occasion for reflection on sin and causality, but is an occasion with revelatory significance. The need that evokes the miracle then is not the man's blindness, but the need for God's works to be made manifest. So, uh, sin basically for John in this particular chapter means your response to the revelation of Jesus. You reject him, that is a gravest sin. In a number of ways, Jesus challenges the common perception of sin. First of all, Jesus challenges the thinking that suffering was direct result of sin. He says that it is neither. Neither can it be assumed that because the Pharisees are healthy, and have normal vision that they are sinless. So, for Jesus, you can still be healthy and also sinful. Just because you are healthy, it doesn't mean you are not sinful. Secondly, he challenges the thinking that sinfulness is directly related to obeying the Sabbath laws. Jesus does what is expressly forbidden. For example, needing. Yet we know he is not a sinner. 
Neither can it be assumed that because the Pharisees perfectly obey the Sabbath laws that they are sinless. Thirdly, he challenges the thinking that neither God nor the righteous, like Pharisees, should listen to sinners. Certainly, God listened to the supposedly sinner. Jesus and the Pharisees should have listened to the formerly blind men. Neither can we assume that because the Pharisees or clergy appear to be righteous, that God listens to them more than to sinners or that they speak for God any more than sinners can speak for God. The core meaning of the miracle is revealed in these words of Jesus. If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But because you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Jesus is saying that only those who admit their blindness or sin can be freed from it and given spiritual sight. Those who in pride claim that they can see are in fact still blind and are, and are unable to receive sight from Jesus. Without humility, no one can come to God. Finally, both can see each other. God always sees us, but we can't see him because of a blindness called sin. Now, not just Jesus, the blind man who is not blind anymore because of Jesus now sees the amazing God. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe and he worshipped him. Remember, the man is seeing Jesus for the first time, both physically and spiritually. This is the final stage of the man's journey into saving relationship. He has been blind. He has been washed in the life-giving water of the sent one, Shilawam. He has known of Jesus. He has identified him as a prophet. He has realized that Jesus was sent from God. He has respectfully called him sir or master and now he sees him for he who really is Lord. The Greek word Kyrios is used here by John, a Jew, to represent Yahweh. A beautiful picture of what has just occurred between Jesus and the healed man appears in the words of the psalmist. Psalm 28 verse 10. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Amen.